the time is then in the classroom to build a deeper understanding. I sort of done that with the instruction and footprints and the labor learning analytics. Some of you know about that, and you know it's, it's been sort of growing worldwide as a movement. Uh, but this created an opportunity to also rethink the information transfer part. So I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about the information transfer, the other class part. I'm going to talk about the projects, which essentially are the Trojan horse. And lastly, I'm going to talk about the impact of this. And then we're going to wrap up some data that we have uh, collected over the past few years. So let's start with the information transfer. I've eliminated this. How do I replace them? Over the 20 some years that I did the instruction in science at the BOC, I first asked if I should read the book. Then, in order to provide an extra little stick, I said, read the book and I'm going to give you a quiz. And then later, when I found that this extrinsic motivation wasn't really good, I got to the technique called just in time teaching, which sort of has not just a stick, but also a carrot in order to get them to, get them to do the reading. But I realized that I spent all of my time working hard on making the in class experience a social experience. Right? The instruction has students teach each other, interact with each other in the classroom, and deep down, learning is a social experience, not an individual experience. In fact, it's so strange, right? I mean, if you start to think about it, all of education is focused on the individual, both in the teaching as well as in the assessment. Even though society is all, it's a completely collaborative experience. No wonder we produce people who, you know, might be very good working alone, but then when they get out of the workspace, it turns out they don't have the requisite collaborative skills to flourish. So anyway, so I said, you know, we have to make the out-of-class component also a social interaction. So we have the platform, which is now uh, online and widely available, perusal, with which we can actually guarantee every student prepared for every classroom. And this part is simply a social learning platform. The students log in through their the first uh, social network, and then once they're on there, they can see who else is online on the book, and they'll add show up. And if they read the book and they don't understand something, they can highlight it, which opens a chat window where you can ask a question. That question then sticks, and after a while, the page will be marked up. You can click on any of these, uh, these uh, markups, and it shows the dialogue between students. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see it. I don't think you can read it, but I'll read it to you. Here's one student on October 20, last semester, at midnight, said, I don't understand how this combination of factors tells you anything about direction, blah, blah, blah. Then 20 minutes later, or 30 minutes later, another student said, I think you may be able to think about the direction separately, and so on. And two days later, another student said, this is a great uh, question to further elaborate. So what you see here is, in essence, an online version of peer discussion, the asynchronous interaction between students helping each other understand the material. Initially, we dove in, because, you know, when you read that, when you have a, your, your fingers are itching to dive into the discussion, I quickly discovered that's the wrong thing to do. The ownership of the discussion should reside with students. Because as soon as you dive in, they take whatever you as the instructor say as the gospel, and they very quickly start to expect you to answer all of their questions, and no longer take trouble of answering each other's question as thoroughly as you might want. Okay, well, I'd like to tell you much more about it. I'm just going to tell you that we use a combination of intrinsic and extrinsic factors to motivate students to participate, and that we get, in a, an average course that we teach with about 60 some students, 20,000 annotations. The students write more text than the author, me in this case, has written in the book, and I took 25 years to do that. Okay, so let's talk about the projects. How do these very good projects, right? We've had many labs and our courses, and in a sense, lab directors are like mini projects, but they're hardly motivating. On the other extreme, you can think of a project that you do for the entire semester in the fall and then another one in the spring, but how do you capture the entire curriculum in one big project? I ended up setting essentially on three projects per semester, six for the entire year, one in a month, so that I could partition the curriculum into three uh, bins. We form teams. We do not let the students choose who they work with. In the real world, you don't choose who you work with either. So we basically engineer the teams so that we diversify the students according to interest, abilities, and then a number of other measures, having to provide more detail uh, later on. Now, in order to design the project, I learned a lot from the business school. I went to serve a number of classes there. And the business school, which makes money actually out of developing and selling cases to other business school, has a set of design criteria for the cases. And it turned out that those design criteria match beautifully onto projects. Just replace the word case by project. Here they are. To be successful, the case, or in my case, the project, must one, require the practical application of skills. So say you teach a finance class at the business school. Well, you want your students later on to be able to determine the market capitalization of a company, or a reasonable stock price at an initial public offer. Makes sense, right? What about physics? Well, same thing. You want your students to be able to apply the laws of mechanics to blah, 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 and so on. So that's uh, easily translated. The second rule is, to be successful, the case must be linked to real-world problems. You know how the, the business school does that? Very simple. They go to the Wall Street Journal, they look at real cases, real companies, and then they change the name of the company so the students can just Google what the IPO price or the market capitalization of the company is. That's a little bit harder, the physics. I mean, I'm sure that in your mind and in my mind, everything we do with physics is the real world. But I imagine not having been exposed to a physics lab 
coming into a physics lab, I see a system of track and oscilloscopes and all kinds of things. I mean, would that confuse images of the real world? I thought, you know, I'm not going to use these labs that, you know, have these sterile equipment and experiment that don't really connect physics to the real world. And then I thought, you know, physics is all around us. I wouldn't go shake it down, but you know, physics is everywhere. Let's use the real world as our laboratory. Let's not use the equipment in the lab, but let's just use the human devices. These phones take pictures at 240 frames per second. You could just tell the motion of a, of a ball thrown up, or a person walking, or a bike, and then analyze it at 240 frames per second, upload it, track the video, and make graphs. Let's use these instead of, you know, sensors that students don't know how they work, and it's all hopes, focus, and magic. So I decided to transport the lab to the real world. The last one gave me some pause. In order to be successful, the case must have a component of empathy or social good. Yes, the business school. <laughs> so, for example, each case starts with the word you. You have been appointed to help a family invest in a narrative. So you're put in a position to help somebody, an entity, a person, or, or society. How do you do that with physics? You know, I had no idea in the first place. It shows that, you know, we're so constrained in our thinking about teaching because we never give ourselves an opportunity to think out of the box. I'll show you how uh, we did that. So here are the six projects, and the names will mean very much to you. We started with a drag race to warm them up the cinematics, and they have to build a group Goldberg machine that has seven different steps. One has to have an elastic collision, another an inelastic collision, another one has to have a, a trajectory, one has to involve a pulley and rotational motion, uh, and so on. There are, there are restrictions. One has to have a, you know what a group Goldberg machine is. One is one of these machines that does a lot, but accomplishes very little. Uh, in this case, it has to crack open an egg at the last step. And then the students have to measure all of the momentum and energy transfers in the entire machine throughout all of the steps. Now, you know, Measuring momentum on a classical card is a Christmas card, it's relatively easy, but also rather not interesting. Here, you have to use the skills developers measuring motion with your own cell phone and digitizing the graphs in order to do that. So the physics is actually quite rich. And then one, the third one, which I'm going to discuss, is the same quality. And it deals with the part of the curriculum that has vibrations, oscillations, waves, and uh, sound. So at the beginning of the, the, the project period, the students receive a brief that gives them all of the information. How do I hook the students? How many of you know about NC Stema? Ah, El Sistema, two years ago, Jose Abreu, an economist from Caracas, Venezuela, um, got an honorary doctorate for starting El Sistema.
But if it just fell severely into rain, it would, the populace would slowly increase in both of our countries. It was quite easy for me to start seeing us. If you were to start to start that would have been better. Sure, all of this should have been moment of the different current group that they lost the night. So the compiler time for such a device would... Now, again, let's calculate 
this um, challenge of the It must be because the new law has been set out. But the first bit of the control is the one that says from here to here, which is particularly the definition of contribution. So you, you realize that the length that you have to go along with it is proportional to the current step, to the interest current. So in a accelerator, this means that the perpendiculars flow on themselves. There's no such aspect. So if you want to do that way of formulating formula these pictures, in fact, is that if you draw the feed lines on the magnetic surface and the perpendiculars, then the feed lines spiral around the force. You follow the feed line here in the surface, it's going to spiral around the force. But the perpendiculars do not spiral, they flow on themselves. And it is the slightest bit counterintuitive fact that this should be possible. She did an earlier realization of what later became astrometric phases in physics. The very phases of the most famous with, but there are others. Maybe you watch. But this is one of, one, one of the first. It's not the first realization of physics, but this is one of the first ones. The same thing happens, I believe, if you turn polarized uh, light down a, an, an optical fiber, which you twist in space. Or it is, um, what, if, if you make it come back to sense, the polarization is just fine. So we can prove, mathematically, that there are exactly three ways of twisting the electric light. This one is just an astrometric equation. You can, you can calculate this winding number, I hope that. Uh, close to the innermost line, that's an integral, and you can show that the integral comes around the forest, and the find that this winding number is the sum of three terms. The first one is the current, that's what you see in the top of that, to push the feed lines, but then there are two other terms, so there's the current question here. First, you have tau. Tau is the torsion of, of this innermost magnetic field line, so the torsion is a concept from differential geometry that characterizes how much the curve deviates from lying in a plane. So that is the curvature vector which points inwards, if you take the curvature vector and cross it with the with the tangent vector, you get the vector that's probably going to work. And if you do this, you get the vector that's The third way of twisting a design line is the following. If you cut the magnetic surface like this, you should have to tell an ellipse to With the major axis and the minor axis, if you let the top section of that ellipse rotate as you go around the force, then, so G here is the angle, the tensing angle of the ellipse. If that, um, if it comes to the tensing angle, that's the tensing angle. It's a bit of a cross section. And you, you make that cross section rotate along the pipe. Then the, then the streamlines of the water will also rotate, although. Even if there's no vorticity in the water. Streamlines can rotate without vorticity, and the streamlines can rotate without current. Perfect, it's not mathematical. So, knowing this now, that's how to twist from the other streamlines, people went off and did some reactors. Now, you can do anything your heart desires. Um, yes, you can think of all sorts of weird stellar reactors. This is the largest one in the world by a virus, it's called the Large Elephant Device, it's in Japan, which is easily going to be with a piece of very color code. This is the second core set that produces it. So, you have, so this is what the classical stuff is. It's just the integration of the stellar reactors. 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 Uh, this is the thermodynamic surface with the, the strength coming out of the game. This is the strange set of coins that produces it. Um, strong resistance. So, this is from the country of the San Marco Valley, of course. Um, so, this is created by, by a red and a blue coin in the same which are tied around each other, and by these 